Yeah, happy Monday. How's it going, everybody? It's going well. We were doing another uh, in-person Monday morning data chat, at least for the two of us. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, you're in Salt Lake again, surprisingly enough. Uh, for PyCon, among other things. Yeah. yeah. How was PyCon? It was good. It was really great to connect with people I haven't seen in a while. That was probably the best part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I, I think I went and got my badge, and then I just had a lot of other things going on. So it, it, it happens. happens. It's, it's almost worse if it's in your home city because you're not away from doing this kind of on vacation. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. So, well, cool. Um, yeah, enough about us. Uh, so we got uh, the co-founders of uh, Cube on the show, um, uh, Pavel and Artem. So for people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Artem. I am one of the co-founders and authors of uh, Cube. Uh, with Pavel, we started Cube in 2019 as an open source project and uh, building building it since then. So super excited to be on the show today. Nice. Yeah, and uh, I'm co-founder and CTO at Cube. And basically, yeah, I, I was building the uh, from scratch a lot. And that's how we learned with Cube. And basically, uh, I... I built the uh, vast majority of a uh, cube in the early days and still building it right now. Yeah, that's cool. Can you talk about it a bit. I'm very curious. Like as a just a um, a founding CTO, especially like how you balance uh, uh, you know maintaining the project while trying to focus on the um, you know the, the productized version of it. I suppose. Yeah. yeah, but but yeah. I mean, so you know, we're here to talk about semantic layers. It's it's a it's becoming a popular term. Uh, I think it's also a term that I sense is. N- is maybe consolidating, but I feel like there's still maybe different definitions of what a semantic layer is. Do you guys want to uh, throw your hat in the ring and, and uh, give us your take on what a semantic layer is? What, what a semantic layer is and is not, I think, is a, maybe a, a good way of framing the question. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. It's the consolidating. Maybe like a two, three years ago, we, we saw some explosion of like a last wave last generation of companies trying you know like to build semantic layer um and we saw a lot of terms like metrics layer metric store headless bi and semantic layer too so and it's been i don't know, like maybe four or five companies that like uh, raised a seed round at series a and cube was one of them that tried it you know like to go after that sort of problem again it's not like that is a first wave, right? We have companies like at scale. And then if we look uh, even uh, at older generation business objects, and to some extent, we can consider, you know, like to be semantic layer as well. But in the last sort of a generation, last wave, it's been a few companies like a Get Cube, Super Grain, Transform Data, and a few more. And yeah, funny enough, like pretty much every company used a different term. Um, I think just because it's still people try to understand how the semantic layer should look like, you know, like what features it should have and where it should, you know, like provide more value, less value, where it has more features. For example, some people would call it metric store, uh, you know, coming out of companies like Airbnb, where they have successfully implemented, you know, like the metrics repositories. And it, they uh, maybe over indexed a little on like metrics definition, you know, like, like, like a Viki for metrics, all of this. So that's, you know, like was one of the version of semantic layer where like more focus was put on to the, you know, like the metrics, how you define them, how data consumers can search for them, all of that. Um, other companies, you know, like uh, Cube used the term and headless BI because we came from the uh, like more like embedded analytics side of the business. And we thought like mm-hmm. a BI is commonly used for embedded analytics, right? And then you have headless BI because we don't give it charts essentially, right? We like give an API for you to build your embedded analytics. That's why we prefer the term headless BI. Uh, but then again, now it's all like consolidating into semantic layer, I think, which is good for like industry because, you know, like it's easier for for uh, practitioners to sort of navigate, navigate the space, less terms, just more consistency. Yeah. Yeah, because I always get confused. I don't, I don't really get the, as confused, but I know back when everyone's talking about metrics, semantics, uh, Lord knows what else. Like I was just like I, I'm unclear on like which one is which. Um, you know, as you point out, Airbnb had its article that you know they they built the metric store many many moons ago, and it was amazing. Right. And I'm like, that's cool. Um, 
what's the difference between a metric and a semantic um it's right. like a, right i don't know it, it so i'm glad that at least um so hopefully consolidating on, on terms but uh yeah i don't know what, what were your thoughts on any of this yeah yeah kind of the same thing i think we're, we're start for a long time <laughs> This was just kind of a it was sort of a buzzword for a while and i think now it's turning into a, a real clear thing about what this exactly is in fact do, do you want to take a stab at just like defining it for the audience here like what, just a very concise definition of what a semantics layer is uh yeah i think th and i feel like every every person who is building you know a semantic layer right now will still give a different answer so okay. we're still going through the sort of consultation, you know, like kind of standardization here. But I think it's an interface to data, and it's uh, it's a data modeling uh, piece of uh, of BI. So um, when I when I look at the you know like what's happening with BI is, is you commonly have a data modeling coupled with with BI, right? And then uh, you need to repeat that data modeling again in every bi mm -hmm. and uh the problem semantic layer is solving is that it's just trying to apply dry to that it's like do not repeat yourself at every bi just extract that data modeling and make it you know like sort of unified for every bi so and then make it an interface to your data right so every bi would go to that data model and kind of use it as an interface so and in short it's an interface and a problem it's solving it's just it solves the repetition through the do not repeat yourself principle right yeah i think the first time i encountered this was um it's seen it in uh business objects a bit and then with uh look ml is i think the first time that i saw it like really explicitly done in a code first way yep. um and so that was it was pretty well. No, actually, the first time I saw this was in uh, in ORMs actually way back in the day oh, with a yeah with a with yeah. like Ruby on Rails right because uh, uh, there uh, was it Active Record or something where it was yeah. allowed you because because then you start because then when I looked at uh, look at I was like this seems suspiciously like what Rails was doing and Django was doing uh, with both templating languages and uh, just the ability to define something once and reuse yeah it. that was pretty yeah. interesting so I uh, will. I will tell you one term that we've been using uh, when we started Cube as well. We called it ORM for data or data ORM. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not to, not to add more inconsistency, you know, like to different <laughs> terms, but that's one we used back then. So, uh, yeah, I, we saw a lot of similarities. My background is uh, I've, I've been coding a little bit in Ruby and Rails. So when we started Cube, I was thinking a lot is like, is it like, is it like a Ruby on Rails for data specifically oh. active record part of the part of the Ruby on Rails? Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty funny actually. Yeah. So I'm not completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny too because you can kind of come at this problem from two different points of view. So there's the ORM point of view, software development. Let's take those principles right. and apply them to to analytics. Yeah, and then there's the problem that any analyst has had when they don't have a metrics layer or semantics layer, and that is. Every analyst is defining their own reports and they're trying to define standardized company metrics like profit or how many customers we have. And the reports are all inconsistent because it's all embedded in individual SQL queries and no one can quite get it exactly the same. Well, but that's what dimensional modeling was supposed yeah. to solve for, yeah. right? It was was having uh, a consistent uh, you know, store of your uh, facts and, and uh, dimensions and, and whatnot. But um, I'd like your take on that too. Like, yeah. do, you, do you feel like that the... the um, I hate to call it the old school way, but I call it the traditional way of data modeling for analytics. Do you feel like that still has a place or do you feel like that's being um, somewhat supplanted by uh, uh, semantic layers or are they, or are they compatible with each other? That's another question. Uh, yeah, I think they're more compatible. It's like dimensional modeling because still, I think it's still relevant and, you know, like I see a lot of people doing it this, maybe, you know, like it still could be a question is like, do we still need to do, you know, like classic, you know, like Kimball style dimensional modeling just because our technology kind of changed a lot, and, you know, like in the last, what, 20, 25 years, and you know, like when, you know, like EDA came initially. And I think it, it's true, technology changed a lot, and now we can just, in many cases, do one big table, right? So I think, you know, like semantic layer should be more of a tool, giving you either doing, you know, like if you don't want to do dimensional modeling, you can still do that, or you want to do like more like OBT, you can still do that as well yeah 
Yeah, it's interesting because and th and then we had who was it Larry Burns in the show a couple yeah. weeks ago and we were talking about data modeling and he was really a fan of even approaching it from the um you know the conceptual and logical layer first and then the physical implementations of whether you choose Kimball or one big table or sort of a secondary uh, issue according to him and he's I mean he's been writing about data modeling since like the early two thousands so I think he's had a lot of time to think about yeah. it like almost at least 20 years or probably more of it when you publish it. But what I find interesting in that is it feels like the, the conceptual and logical modeling is definitely gone. I would argue somewhat by the wayside um, and people really focus on sort of the um, have it implemented in say a data warehouse or a cloud data platform, I guess, as they're now called uh, modern yeah, data yeah. stack uh, yeah. or whatever. But that's um, at least it's an observation I've had. I'm not sure if you're seeing something different, but it, it seems like, again, like the conceptual logical which is more kind of the higher level modeling is um, maybe being somewhat ignored. And, you know, we just make a bunch of metrics and, uh, and just throw them into reports. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing or again, if I'm just like crazy and stuff. So. Yeah. yeah I think it's, it feels it's, it's definitely more diverse and, you know, like if people don't try to be, you know, kind of put into some boundaries, it's like you, you do, you know, like that and follow the book specifically, right. in your data modeling. So you can, you follow your, you know, like your, your entity structure, your, your business model, you know, like, and again, yes, you can, you can, you know, like, I think all these techniques, they are like secondary really. So, you know, like, and if you feel that what I see, just like people, you know, like people feel they just working and doing the job, then they apply in it, right? So same with Cube, right? When I think about the data modeling in Cube, it just, it's not built for one specific technique, right? So it, again, it could support, if you want to do data dimensional modeling you can do that if you want to do one big table you can do that i think overall you know uh cube approach is closer probably to like one big table really mm. but you know like it's still still easier to do like uh dimensional if needed you mentioned look ml so you know i think it's cube has just two two entities as well as like look look ml has views and explorers we yeah. call them cubes and views a little bit different names but they like serve the same purpose so you build your data graph where you define all the joints everything and then you just build we call it views just like one big table so you you ex explore them in you know like you build them to expose into different bi's and then bi's right. can read them as one big tables if right. needed if you still prefer to dimensional modeling so you can you can rebuild it as you know like it's more dimensional modeling and then the bi's will look at it as the star schema or snapflake schema but default way is just to do one big uh one big table got it that's pretty cool she got a couple of questions already uh it's gonna be a good show if you're getting questions this early uh jeffrey jacobs asks on linkedin uh why aren't views useful more for semantic layers uh yeah uh, and I, I assume views is more like uh more like uh, database views. Yeah, yeah, because we did mention yeah. look ML views, which aren't exactly the same thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, I'm gonna assume it's a database view. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I, I can I can jump on it, Pavel, and then feel free to feel free to chime in because uh, we talk a lot about it. Why you know like why we is it really what are you building? Is it it's it's is it adding value? You can just run and you know like uh, everything inside your like warehouse and build a bunch of views. I, I think to answer that question, I need to look at the, you know, like when we look at the semantic layer, I think usually about two things. One is how do you define semantic layer? And then how do you query semantic layer? The first thing is defining semantic layer. I believe the DDL is not just the best way to define semantic layer, just, you know, like for managing your data definitions and metrics. So you need some sort of, you know, like a declaration language, uh, which you can put under the version control and then you know like you can collaborate with that so you you know like you can make safely changes you can make aprs you can read that so you know like just applying everything you know like in, in, in definitions of a views it could be not uh, you still need some framework even if it compiles down to the views uh eventually you still need some sort of you know like a good framework to to manage and scale the definitions of the data and then on the second side uh the how you query that the problem with that, the databases, they don't have a notion of the measure right now and the concept of a measure at all. So you still will do all the aggregations on a, on a querying site, right? 
So uh, while it could be fine for like a very simple aggregations, it's easily get, you know, like uh, nested, it's easily get, get more advanced and tricky. And this way you're starting doing this aggregation during the query time. And uh, that's actually a part of the metric definition. That's a part of the your data definition and then started to happen on the BI side. So that's probably why, you know, like it's not possible to do uh, yeah, very good yeah. use. And also joins, I think, once you land a joint problem like with use, uh, you you have actually two options. So either you would expose like joint dimension in a view and basically do the joins inside your SQL where you query, and then you need to uh, basically solve the chasm and trap problem, which is by itself uh, uh, like uh, very very hard problem to solve like inside in SQL and manage. Or you can incorporate your joints and views, but you end up with a combinatorial explosion. It's very, mm -hmm. very easy to get like uh, basically uh, 120 tables out of five you need to join like under the hood. So, and that's, that's uh, something that becomes very unmanageable pretty quickly. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think of this problem, having worked with LookML, for example, somewhat in the past. Um, the, the this approach, like the kind of look and mail semantic layer approach, is more flexible in terms of mixing and matching metrics. Whereas otherwise, you get this massive combinatorial problem defining you know a thousand different views or something across data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, Sunny Rivera has a question here, and he's actually got a couple questions. I'll start with the uh, latest one here, and it goes back to when you comment on uh, DDL there, Artem. Um, yes, why hasn't DDL adopted semantic layer functions, or is or yes, am I going off the rails? No pun intended for Ruby on Rails, I'm guessing, but um yeah uh, uh yeah i think you know like if i if i take a step back why data warehouses are not building semantic layers right probably it would be a question and then you know like ddl could be a tool for them to build that uh, i think you know like data warehouse vendors they are looking into building semantic layers so google bought looker specifically for that right we we all know that LookML is a semantic layer for BigQuery yep. and like LookML is going to exist only to sell more BigQuery. Um, so um, why it's not, why they bought Looker and not doing this with some sort of, you know, like DDL. I, I just think, you know, my take is that DDL is not the best tool for the job for defining the metrics. Maybe there is some way, you know, like extending it, but it may look, you know, like if you extend it to an, much, you know, like it's going to look like a look ML. So why not just like have something like a look ML instead uh, or any other, you know, like a semantic layer framework to, to define metrics. Again, I just don't think it's just DDO is the best way of, of doing this, but it may be done technically. So, you know, like, and we'll see. Yeah, but before it's done, it should be like extended. SQL itself should be extended because it's not enough from SQL perspective. Yeah. For sure. Here's another question I have, like in the cloud era, and maybe even before with Hadoop plus data warehouses, we saw this kind of proliferation of analytic systems. In other words, a company, instead of having one main analytic system might have two or three. So say they have Databricks and BigQuery or Databricks and Snowflake. Um, does, do semantic layers play a role there in combining data from different systems? We, we got a little question a lot. Um, and oh, okay. I think that comes to the, uh, you know, like, are we, we're still talking about definition of semantic layer, right? Like when we started, it's like, we try to understand what it should done versus what it shouldn't. That's one I'm still, still, you know, like wrapping my head around. Uh, there is a category of software, like a pre Trino Presto, right? So, you know, like, it's like a query federation that, you know, like you would expect to do that. I don't think, and, you know, like dream IO too. So do we, um, should that be a part of, you know, like semantic layer or not? Should they build their own semantic layer? So I think we have some crossovers that uh, we still try to understand. My take is that, for example, Cube shouldn't do that. While we have a cross data source, you know, like joins and cross data source just querying overall, I think it's just intended to bring more like semantic layers that can work on top of multiple data sources rather than trying, you know, like to really do like a complicated federation. So, uh, and when it, you know, like someone from a community is asking me, 
can I use Google Federation? I would say like technically you can try to use it to that extent, but you probably need to look at Trina. You know, like that's going to be probably the better fit for your use case. And then you can run a cube on top of Trina. So uh, Pavel, you, you may have a different take on this. No, that, that, that's it. I guess uh, like from like data modeling perspective, once you land on a complex query federation, uh, problem you should you should use uh, like query federation engine because under the hood and cube we don't build full fully fledged query engine we have a cache mm -hmm. which can be suited to fulfill the gap between you have like uh, data in one place you you can like create that and the data in another place and just join two rollups together but not beyond that just when you have a sense of very specific query that can be served from like two data sources but not on data modeling or ad hoc query anything like that interesting i see sunny has a follow-up question here uh he says when we say data modeling do we model for analytics versus warehouse or application data modeling i think that's a good question so uh -huh. I felt I've been answering all the questions. Paul, okay. if you want to take yeah. it, I can yeah. do that. I mean, what are your thoughts though on, on, I guess, a, a, a semantic layer for application data modeling? I feel like this is an area where, um, you know, it, it's something I've been writing a lot about. The, uh, I would say that it, there's it, it, kind of paralleling what, what's happening in analytics where maybe we need to kind of rethink how we're, um, uh, defining our metrics, right? I mean, the same thing is happening over in um, uh, applications as well, right? So, I mean, you've all worked with ORMs. I'm sure you you know the uh, the joys and the absolute uh, horror show of a mess you can create with your data uh, using an ORM. And so, do you have any thoughts on application um, data modeling um, with semantic layers? Yeah. And by application, you, you mostly mean OTP stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think right now uh, with this whole concept, there is also a concept like of entity layer, and there is a whole question about like should this like semantic layer thing grow into like OTP stuff? I would say it's it's an open co question, and uh, there are uh, that's like very nice idea, and uh, but there are like too too many like technical hurdles right now to overcome because in a sense like from technological perspective you need completely different set of technologies to sort all app traffic versus OTP traffic uh it means uh, while you can model all the stuff pretty the same way but from uh like uh, from serving perspective it should be different and a lot of stuff which is happening like on modeling layer like for example for cube uh, it boils down to like tweaking the performance stuff and at that point uh, you would need to have like two branches like OTP on the lab but I think like uh, at the end of the day there are ways to do it but there are like really big technical challenges to overcome like um, for example eventual consistency what if you're using data warehouse but you you want to write back based on the data from data warehouse like snowflake tries to solve it right like providing otp on transactions stuff like that but still like a very uh long way to go mm, yeah i can see that so well i mean as you point out you know just even um collecting all the analytical data sources together and trying to come up with a consistent way of doing it there is i can imagine that's challenging so i'm trying to guess, the, the one uh semantic layer to rule them all would be uh and I guess on another level too, does it, I mean, there's certain nuances where maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. So in an application, if you define certain things a certain way, like uh, things related to a customer, maybe analytical questions are, you know, they're, they're usually different and same with machine learning. So, um, but I think something like that will probably happen at some point. It seems to be the inevitability, but maybe not. Well, especially for real-time data, that's where we've talked about it a lot, where it's exactly you a, might have a separate, you know, facts dimensions model for your data warehouse, but there are certain real-time analytics where you right. need to define that schema in, in the application. Like you cannot post-process it fast enough, basically. That's what I think data contracts are trying yeah. to attempt, yeah, right? Yeah. But it's, you know, what are your thoughts on data contract? I mean, where does a data contract uh, kind of intersect with a semantic layer and then where are they uh, completely different? Uh, 
I think that Manticlair should should have some way to work with the data contracts. Uh -huh. I know. I just uh, I I try to understand this data contract should be a feature of some you know like of some software, some tool we have. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe like a CDP, you know, like like collection overall, or you know, like and somehow to be integrated with Manticlair, or it should be some sort of you know like a separate tool uh, that sits you know like and work across multiple you know like again it works with semantic layers etl and you know like cdp and just kind of you know like ensures some sort of you know like defines and ensures contracts or we just move the you know like the process again and you know like and then the parts of this process should be implemented across multiple tools so i think it's a little it's a little unclear so i haven't seen yeah. a lot of you know like practical implementation of this i mean like every company has some sort of you know like a documentation rules and you know like a guidelines you know like around around that area but it's not like some you know like standardization or like some system sort of you know like kind of yeah. uh, approach that i have been seeing you know like consistent across multiple orgs of implementing this uh and i, I haven't seen a specific vendor that's you know like uh, dedicated to to doing this you know like and kind of pushing for some specific philosophy here so yeah, I mean, I mean, what is what is your take? I I, I, I mean, I think a, a data contract is very much a defense mechanism. It's not an offense mechanism, right? So you, you're basically like trying to ensure that whatever contract you have with upstream producers is what you expect as a consumer, and, and that um, it catches a violation you know, before it makes its way to production, right? And so it's 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 a check and a balance. I, what what's what the things I've been thinking about right now is sort of what's the intersection of like stuff like data catalogs, semantic layers, contracts. Um, so I feel like these roles similar ish in their own ways, but they're different enough where maybe they are standalone. I uh, um, would love your take on sort of the, uh, you know, where does a semantic layer fit in with the data catalog, for example, yeah. that's an open ended question. I would love your opinion on. Yeah, that one is, that one's a little bit more tangible than, you know, like Kratos and uh, yeah. data contracts at this point, because we got a lot of like data catalogs vendors out there, right? Um, yeah, I think some people expect to have some sort of, you know, like a data catalog features around semantic layers. It's what I, you know, like see, you know, like by, by talking to people, especially, you know, like if we talk about the idea of the metrics store or metrics repository, right? Like the people would go in to see all your metrics, you know, like to see how to query those metrics. Uh, so that's really feels a little like a data catalog already. Mm -hmm. um, what we do at Cube and, you know, we'll see whether it's the right approach or not. We'll try to not build it at all, almost at all. We're building some internal tools just to help semantic layer engineers to work with uh, with the data model, you know, like to understand lineage, graph, all of that. But they, it, these tools, they're not intended to be exposed to the end data consumers. So instead we wanted to integrate with uh, tools on the market, like Alation, right, or something like that, just to give, you know, like data consumers and, you know, like all the business units a way to look at this sort of, you know, like metrics and catalogs through the, their existing data catalog solution. So I, again, I feel like semantic layers just should integrate with existing tools, but yeah, it may be a different approach. Yeah. Interesting. We've got a question here from uh, Jonathan Neo. What's up, Jonathan? It's uh, it's in Australia right now. I have no idea what time it is. Um, but he asks, uh, do you think that we'll have the same decoupling and semantic layer and the visualization layer like we've seen in front end, uh, back end frameworks like Node.js and uh, front end frameworks like React? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the short answer is yes. Um, I think that whole idea, you know, like, uh, of the, of the semantic layer is to decouple the function of BI, right? As he, he mentioned in, in the beginning, because like we have a data modeling and then we have a visualization in a BI, like a LookML in Looker, the rest of the Looker with charts and all of that. And then the idea is just like, let's decouple that again for the purpose of, you know, like make it dry and, you know, like just make it, maintain it uh, separately. And what happened with a, you know, like a, application development is a really good, you know, like a uh, example back then in Ruben Rails days, right? We were writing called big, you know, like a full stack applications with all the logic, you know, like have been in one monolith application. Now we sort of decouple it 
and it's it's only benefits right we can we can maintain it and we can scale it so yeah the same the, the same idea here and i believe it could happen i think the the, the biggest issue the biggest challenge is how to make sure that the bi experience is still native even if a data model is decoupled because many bis their ui and their interfaces and the user experience is being really driven by data model it's like looker and you define an explorer and, and then you have this explorer and a list of explorers right so now you're decoupling data model how you make sure that the, the ui of the bis is still you know like working well and it's still user friendly and it's easier for you know like non-technical data consumers to consume data through the bi while data model is decoupled so that's a, that's the biggest challenge yeah it's, it's actually really interesting it brings up a point that um like I always, I always kind of joke with Matt and with the audience that data feels like it's about 10 to 15 years behind software. I mean, I don't uh, think it's even really a joke. It's not a, I mean, it's a reality, but I ha we have to joke because it's kind yeah, of yeah, depressing. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, uh, but the, the notion of like MVC, which, you know, rails, I, I think adopted back in the day, you know, tightly viewed. I mean, it, it's interesting though, because you don't, you, I, I haven't personally seen like the same sorts of paradigms being discussed in the data world where uh, NBC is sort of old hat and, and software development, but it did represent when it was, you know, popular back in the 2000s, like a way of abstracting out your model, your view and your controller. Um, and each of these had separation of concerns. Obviously, there's there's new paradigms now um, and so forth. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's kind of interesting that because it sort of represents a similar ish type of conversation of how do we start decoupling out? The view layer from the the model layer and and, and so forth and it's uh, i don't know if you you guys have had nerdy discussions like matt and i have had on, on this topic but uh you seem like you guys have fun chats like that yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think we even rem when we were uh, yeah, we obviously been talking about mvc too i think we remembered even facade patterns it's one of the you know like this like canonical patterns in the book right so the like facade pattern i think reminds you know like uh, the data model a little as well where you know like you're really building facade of your data right yeah. with semantic layer and then you're exposing it to, as an interface to the um to the like all the bi tools but yeah i i see a lot of similarities here uh you know like with, with orm mentioned and you know like in this c concept so and uh it's it's funny also you know like maybe to follow up on one of the questions that previously been asked about application data modeling it will be interesting to see how at some point, you know, like, and I believe it will, you know, like all these ideas will start, will start to converge, you know, like, and we'll have application development and data development, you know, like kind of, you know, yeah. like starting to, to kind of, you know, like uh, uh, coming together, uh, especially, you know, like if warehouses will provide some sort of uh, transactional support yeah. eventually for us, right? Uh, so that would be an so-called aged up architecture. So that would be that would be interesting to see. What is what, what is your take on that? By the way, how do you how do you we, see that is coming? We wrote we wrote about this in the last chapter of our book, uh, Fundamentals of Data Engineering, and it was so we we kind of speculated on the future of data engineering. And I think what we one of the conclusions we had was there's just going to be I think a fusion of uh, software engineering, data engineering, and ML engineering. Like because data really. In the past, data existed in sort of a one-way life cycle, right? Where you know it kind of starts, it's created, then it goes somewhere else, and it becomes a report, and then who knows what happens? So maybe a decisions made, but that it's a very fuzzy feedback cycle in that respect. But but now, you know, with the rise of you know data-powered applications, you know whether that's you know analytical data or whether that's machine learning, this goes right back into the application. And so I feel like software engineers and data engineers and ML engineers at some point are be going to become basically the similar type of person, perhaps the same person, maybe you're just a full stack data developer now or something, I don't know, but it's, but I feel like there's a very interesting artificial divide between, um, maybe it's not artificial, maybe it's necessary in some cases, but I think we overstate like the importance of like, oh, well, analytics is over here and this is analytics and software is over here. This is software and machine learning is over here. Like I was just I'm actually finishing the slides on my talk I'm giving uh, in Munich later this week about the, um, you know, the intersection of uh, data engineering and ML engineering and how, it, you know, I could make a very strong argument. They're very similar and a very strong argument. They're not. Uh, and so um, you can hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time. But uh but with software, it's it's fascinating because you're exactly right. It feels like the world is converging, right? HDAP and so forth. Um, 
Right. The data engineers and data people are starting to talk about software practices, uh, and I'm glad this is happening. So, it, it, but the, 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 I think the crux of it's really going to be software engineers understanding data, which I think has been the harder part, because um, software engineers typically, depending where you work, obviously, if you work at a big company, right, where there's data power, you know, you're kind of data centric and data powered applications, like that's just part part of your job. Your title may, might not be data engineer, but you're working on some of the biggest data systems in the world. So, I don't know. What do you think, Matt? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I tend to agree. I think there is this very much the traditional <coughs> separation between the data generators, basically, and the people who consume on the analytics side. And that's caused a lot of headaches, right? Like, no amount of downstream data modeling can fix data problems that you create in your application. I mean, you can kind of clean things up, but there, there are certain things you're not going to be able to restore, or there's just a lot of yeah. pain around the amount of time ETL takes, for example, you know, data pipelines to get things in order. And I think, I mean, the, the data mesh concept is very controversial, but the part about it that I really like is the fact that you're integrating the data creators with the people who are responsible for analytics, right? And so mm -hmm. whatever the ultimate team structure is, I hope we can kind of get rid of that artificial divide, especially in big enterprises, but it exists in startups too. Yeah, it exists. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, so it's part of the, the notion of the new book I'm working on is just sort of the end to end, you know, thinking about data modeling from end to end and, and the data life cycle. Um, and end to end also means like um, beginning to beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is sort of the, uh, the the the, uh, the thought process. So I don't know. I'm very fascinated to see where this this goes over the next few years. I think, like the semantic layer is definitely the, a giant first um, step towards that sort of decoupling that will actually make this make sense. Because right now, because everything is monolithically tied to each other, it, it's it's impossible to get these separation concerns by definition. And so that, I think it's a huge right. hurdle to making this happen. So I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, these are all good questions, actually. Uh, Sonny asks, uh, do you think, um, yeah, do you, kind of going back to what we were talking about maybe a few minutes ago, but do you think that semantic layers and models will be focused on non-technical users for self-service analytics and more traditional data teams of analytics engineers? Um, I think semantic layers and models should definitely be focused on non-technical users, to ha helping them to navigate, you know, like the data model and hopefully not make mistakes when they know like self-surfing. Uh, but also they could be helpful for the data analysts who are building, uh, you know, charts and dashboards to provide to the non-technical users. or so maybe, you know, like building uh, embedded analytics application and then data apps just because, uh, you know, they would be able to query the same metrics, you know, like and not repeat themselves when the data modeling. So there is like a huge benefits here. Uh, I think the sort of a semantic layer should still give away, you know, like to sometimes maybe query the raw data and then merge it with the model data, especially, you know, like for more like a data teams and analytics engineers who need more power. Uh, so it's, it's sort of, it's sort of a facade and a protection, right? And then at some point, we we need to understand when you know, like when some people and some teams should be able to bypass that protection. So that's that's something that's been on top of our mind as well as like how that should be designed, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, like based on different consumption scenarios. Uh, but uh, I think you know, like definitely to support dashboarding and you know, like a slight exploration that use cases can definitely be supported from a semantic layer. If you're talking about more like a detailed, uh, you know, like data investigation, I would say almost, I, I think, you know, like here we're more talking about, yes, some data can come from a semantic layer, but then still going to be a lot of, you know, like a query raw data for, you know, like we're like, we're talking about really data professional and they usually know, you know, like what they data and, you know, like we're talking about the, the you know, like a different error proneness, right? Rather than, you know, business users and non-technical users. Makes sense. And then um, kind of going in a roundabout way with the questions, uh, but uh, Jonathan also asked uh, kind of a follow-up question to his question about de decoupling the uh, semantic layer and the visualization layer. Um, he says, if that's the way forward, uh, why haven't we have a better abstraction for the visualization layer that feels closer to uh, how BI tools exist. He said, so far, the visualization frameworks that exist, like D3, Plotly, Leaflet, Chart, require a front-end developer to implement. Uh, 
Um, probably want to announce for that. Or... Yeah, I, I think <laughs> yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so I think what's happening right now. So we are, um, I would say, at the at the beginning of a market annealing that basically should happen if like semantic layer is a thing. So the, the uh, why we don't see this too yet is just a question. I, I guess it's just a matter of time because there was no like semantic layer which is like uh, self-sustained and uh, there are not not a lot of those yet. So I guess uh, once semantic layer exists like as a technical implementation, right? So there should be more and more tools that connect to those semantic layers and we we'll see more and more like thin tools that either have like really integrated like uh, uh, semantic layer uh, on their side, either don't have it and just use like existing ones. Uh, like we can see one tool like which is called Light Dash, which is like heavily mm -hmm. built on top of DBT, right? Uh, but they built mostly on top of like DBT models. Uh, uh, however, I think uh, this will continue to evolve once we see more and more like semantic layer implementations which work. Yeah, I think that's something we've seen too, especially when you get into embedded analytics, it's still not perfect, right? You can definitely take the route. And we see this a lot where software engineers will, you know, take one of the, um, you know, frameworks that uh, Jonathan posted there and, um, you know, take a stab at it. The issue is that software engineers typically aren't trained in the uh, art of building visualizations. Well, and it's so, just like design and visualization and everything yeah. else. It's kind of a weird crossover where you need analytic skills, but you also need like design, UX, UI, all these pieces. Yeah. They look like shit, to be frank. It's tough, yeah. yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, some of them, some of them are good. I've, I've yeah, worked some some of them are like fantastic. Um, yeah, I remember one time I had to build a. Uh, I started a job and and in two weeks I had to get out um, an entirely new uh, analytical um, framework for the company. Um, that was a nice crash course and a lot of stuff. But the designer I worked with was fantastic. We we luckily got it out in that time frame. But that was pretty bananas, especially like oh, cool. Get started. Like, Cool, I'll I'll do that. Um, so it can be done, but it, it does take somebody I think who has a good eye on design, and hopefully it becomes a lot more um, available. I know that you know it, it'll be interesting to see what the intersection is of the uh, open source frameworks and also the BI vendors and kind of because uh, I think a lot of BI tools tend to be very kind of top heavy. I would say, um, and right, they, you know, they solve certain types of questions, but if they come up with a very lightweight view of of how they do stuff too, that would be pretty sick. So but yeah. Um, Gosh, lots of fun questions here. Davis, Vance, uh, we're actually doing a uh, an AMA with him later today for his book club. So. Yeah, yeah. And also, are you going to be at the uh, low-key happy hour in New York? I'm trying to make it, so I should be there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Davis. Really cool dude. Um, but uh, he asked, do non-technical do non -technical users want to be more involved, or do we hire analytics professionals to do that work for them? He says, I think adding more data distracts business users from the work of thinking about customers and building solutions for them, uh, same dichotomy. So I don't know if you have thoughts on this. <laughs> David stuff. <does. laughs> um, and I think it's not really connected to semantic layer a little bit more like a workflow question, right? Yeah, uh, more of a macro question. Yeah, I think uh, data teams should definitely be embedded into the business, you know, like, and I feel like maybe in a organization scale, so we should have multiple, you know, like uh, data professionals being embedded into multiple, multiple verticals of the business and just kind of building this understanding of that and then bringing that understanding back to, you know, like the, the data modeling. Should data modeling be centralized or not? Uh, I think it would probably, if we'll have a centralized platform, a framework that helps to scale into different departments and segments, that would be ideal. And then we'll be able to have data professionals who are embedded into specific departments to own some part of that uh, centralized but specialized semantic layers, or like a data model, that would, that would be great. But uh, yeah, that's just, my quick take on take on that question. Any take, Pavel? 
Yeah, I, I think like uh, uh, I guess right now, like I want to touch more on like the semantic where I think here. It's uh, actually maybe like uh, semantic layer stuff should help uh, more this, with this uh, uh, like I would say hiring question. So uh, I think that that's that's the demand we see like from our like early adopters of like semantic layer thing. That's actually uh, they want to try to solve this all the data mess and uh, basically save time for like doing actual job with the data rather than fulfilling like question from their business stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. What do you think about it? Does more, what's more data uh, help or hurt? <laughs> so. I don't know. It depends. I mean, I, I actually, I have some thoughts that are, are trickling down through this whole discussion today, which is we almost need to focus, maybe someone is already writing on this, I'll have to look around, but we almost need, need to think more about data UX. We need to think about this in terms of a user experience, because I think technical people tend to think just in terms of, okay, what's my data model? And it tends to be a physical data model, kind of like you were saying, Joe, right? Like they're very focused on the nuts and bolts and data. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have people who maybe just care about pretty visualizations and you really need to care about that whole experience end to end so that the data is accessible as possible. So more, I would say basically more data can be a problem. It, going back earlier to an earlier part of the discussion, you have your highly technical like exploratory analysts who dig into the raw data and look for new insights, but often business users just get confused by too much data too early. I think this is changing though too. Yeah. I, I, my podcast I was doing on uh, my other podcast, uh, the Joe Reese show, but we're talking with Ryan Dolly about this a couple of weeks ago. And I think he actually had a very good point where he's, he's had a series of articles where he's written that I think he, the whole, the whole way we've been doing BI needs to be rethought. Um, I, I would say, you know, and I, I do agree. It's we're, we're stuck in this dashboard mode uh, of way of thinking, and it's somewhat antiquated. I mean, you know, tell me that. And here's why: a lot of the same questions and the same issues that we've been running into for decades, we still have them. And, I, and at some point, you need to maybe look in the mirror and ask, okay, is it maybe is it the way we've been doing things that needs to be called into question as data people? And I would say, yeah, there, there are. We should rethink this. Maybe people you know, need to consume data in different ways. It's a different experience. And the other thing, obviously, that, you know, the big elephant in the room are large language models and how that's going to impact uh, BI. I think that that needs to be uh, thought about and, and um, well, people are doing it and thinking about it later, but, um, you know, it's uh, the nature of it. But that's that's going to change a lot of the interface, I would say. Um, I know, you know, companies like ThoughtSpot already integrating in, you know, their own GPT type of a interfaces and I expect stuff like that's going to be table stakes uh, pretty soon. How you train it on your own data and get it um, to produce correct answers is like an entirely different question um, that'll let people smarter than me figure out. But uh, I, I think that's going to be the table stakes interface, something like that. So yeah, but you're, what you're alluding to here, I think is it's really exciting that there's the solution hallucination problem where it might just make things up instead of giving you correct answers. Oh, we saw that the other day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we asked chat GPT uh, what, uh, you know, who who wrote our book and, and it came back with uh what was it I, i'm a, a senior data engineer at google and you you're like a senior data scientist at airbnb, airbnb or something, or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, which we're not i don't know yeah. i yeah. checked so uh yeah it's yeah. it's interesting but um yeah i mean kind of kind of you know wrapping it up like what do you what do y'all think is next like if you're if you're to kind of uh put on your uh, nostradamus hat and and you know and predict five years from now where semantic layers are going to be what, what do you, where do you think it's going to be at uh, I think that convergence of, you know, like software engineering and data engineering, you know, like, and basically all TP and all up, I think that's, uh, that's one big, big area where, you know, like, hopefully we'll see innovation in, in the next five years, you know, like, and really, you know, like this two type of the workloads and, you know, like two type of the applications kind of being converged together and, you know, like semantic layers, hopefully we'll be able to facilitate that. Um, the other thing is, as you just mentioned, large models, right? And just like uh, all the AI, uh, the innovation that we see happening right now, uh, how that going to impact the data? And, you know, like it's it's hard to predict at this point, you know, like there are some practical applications, as you mentioned, like ThoughtSpot. And we I know there are some other companies that are building on top of Cube as well, you know, like to provide the natural language interface. Because now this AI system, they actually can ask follow-up questions. I think that was a missing piece back then, you know, like when ThoughtSpot 
and some other companies try to build the the like natural language interface to the data. It was like pretty much, you know, like one one shot. You kind of try to ask a question and the yeah. system tries to guess and gives you an answer. And now this actually the system can start asking the follow-up questions like, what do you mean by active users? And what do you mean by the quarter, right? Like and all of this. So you know, like and it can create this understanding and then query semantic layer and then you know like it hopefully gives you the correct answer. So I think you know like it's going to be a lot of interesting interesting you know like ways to interface and in and work with data like ai driven ways to explore and work with data so that's something you know like i'm really looking forward in the next five years too yeah that's cool what, what do you think Pavel? yeah i think i think like from semantic layer perspective uh i think sql should be extended uh like uh, mm. in five upcoming years and it and it will actually blur the lines uh, of like semantic layers, data warehouses, BI tools, and basically will create a lot more ways of for interconnection. Uh, basically, uh, uh, like BI tools, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, gain some data from like based on a SQL from other like semantic layers, either like built like uh like as a standalone semantic layers like cube or like semantic layers inside of data warehouses there there will be a standard like more like standardized way to fetch this data and query this data using sql so it will create a lot of more opportunities to like interconnect tools yeah uh but at the end of the day i believe uh more like this in like software engineering practices win and uh, like semantic layers, which code based will like become more like a standard here. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. No, that's it's an interesting perspective. Yeah, and I, my personal take is I think they're here to stay. I don't think they're, they're going anywhere. I, I don't think we're going to go back to the world just like a kind of scattershot SQL queries and um, you know promiscuous definitions just floating around uh, in the air i don't know what do you think uh probably here to stay just going to evolve rapidly yeah i, I love this discussion artun about uh, the interactivity of uh these large language models and starting with chat gpt right and if you think about it if you think about using uh, uh i don't know like siri right that interaction is very stilted it's very phone tree like it's like push right. one push two whatever yeah. Yeah. Or is this like open-ended using a tool to explore your data? And then if we can combine that with semantic layer, that yeah. seems like a very powerful approach. Yeah, because I mean, the thing that the LLMs get wrong is that, well, they get a lot of things wrong. Um, I mean, because they're, they're basically, just, they're, they're token prediction engines. Yeah. They, yeah. Oh, they're supposed to provide the most convincing answer that, you know, based on a probability of, um, you know, what, what tokens are yeah. associated with what word path you're on. Um, and that's it. It's not... I mean, and, and so like with GPT-4, they were, you know, through the human interaction, the reinforcement cycle there, it gets more accurate, but that's um, not what it's trained to do from a deep learning perspective, right? right? right. As far as I can tell, I need to keep it number four, like very quiet. Um, but having a semantic layer would be cool because then at least you provide, assuming it can be trained correctly on it, the definitional integrity of like, what does a metric mean, right? So that's, right. that's sort of the missing piece. So right, cause right now it's like, well, I don't know, customer could be a, a horse or a... Uh, or a car, well, you basically which doesn't make any sense, checks, right? Yeah, to, to actually validate that it's giving you correct information semantically, it sounds like a very important tool for that. Yeah, certainly. Cool, awesome. Uh, cool. Um, for people who want to learn more about what you guys are up to at Cube, how can they do that? Um, the Cube is open source, so and you know that's probably GitHub repository is the best place to land on Cube. Nice. You know, like and we have a website, so too, so. You know, like there's two areas, and we have a Slack community, so to ask questions. So right. this three places probably the best. You know, like way, and you know, like I also welcome everyone. You know, like who wants to learn more, just ping me on LinkedIn. You know, like I would would, would love to chat. Cool, yeah. And uh, I'll throw it out to Jonathan Neo if he's looking for another open source project to uh, contribute to. Maybe a, <laughs> a shout out to the guys at Cube. So it's that's cool what you're working on. I, I, I'm uh, excited for the, the that future. So thanks for being on the show. Thank um, you. Thank you for having cool. us. Yeah, anytime. Uh, upcoming stuff for us, Matt. What are you uh, up to this week? Um, I'm trying to make it to the low key data happy hour in uh, Manhattan tomorrow. So if I make if my flight gets there in time, I should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's, that's well, it's yeah. 2023 and flights are. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, who knows? Lord knows, who knows what the hell happens with that. <laughs> yeah. 
That sounds fun. Um, yeah, and I'll be in uh, Munich um, later this week. I'll be keynoting at the Applied AI Conference in Munich. Uh, some MLOps thing that's on, what is it, Friday? So if you're in the area, um, come say hi. Then I'll be in Berlin uh, next week um, just hanging out. I think I'm doing a bunch of podcasts there. So it should be fun. Um, yeah, I ran into one of the guys here, uh, Sebastian, actually, at, at PyCon. We're at a uh, AWS event. And, Recognize him by his funny mustache, so we're gonna go to a podcast. It's it's good to have a distinctive mustache. Yeah, it is. I, I can't grow one. Um, look, absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. So, um, oh, and by the way, so Matt and I were um starting to uh, do data engineering workshops as well. So, if you want, uh, if your company wants to, um, you know, you and your data team want to learn uh, data engineering, uh, hit us up. You know how to get a hold of us, uh, and so that'd be a lot of fun to work with a lot of the companies out there. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll have some information available for you. So if yep. you reach out, you can have a conversation about it. Yeah. yeah, sounds fun. All right, cool. Well, we'll see you all next Monday. Uh, so we'll talk then. All right, see ya. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks.